want to listen to this Ivory Tower Boiler Room episode and all of our Ivory Tower Boiler Room episodes ad-free, head to our Patreon, patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Ivory Tower Boiler Room for $5 a month. You get all of our ad-free episodes, our video interviews, and our bonus episodes. See you there. This last sentence, I'm just, I was so excited <laughs> to write it. But the work of Rimby Parlett and other recent scholars offers promise for future studies by posing the question, what happens if Whitman's queer male poetics is allowed to speak for itself and his male homoerotic poetic language stands on its own without being categorized as, quote, gay, quote, homosexual, or, quote, bisexual. Hi, everyone. This is Andrew. I am so excited to feature this really special celebratory episode. I'm joined with guest co-host Jack Parlett, who soon you're going to hear from. But before I start the official episode, I wanted to thank Hollis Beach, who was my editor for Walt Whitman and Queer Theory. I was so appreciative to have been asked by Gale Literature Criticism to publish this work. And I'm really happy to, that it's now out in the world, that you all can read my Whitman and Queer Theory article. The links for the article are in the show notes. I also am sharing the link out on my social media. So follow me on at Andrew David Rimby if you don't follow me on Instagram. And I also do have a Twitter, so you can follow me. It's at Andrew D. Rimby. And also follow the podcast at Ivory Tower Boiler Room on Instagram. And Twitter's, it's at Ivory Boiler Room. And I'm so just, it was a wonderful experience working with Hollis. It was wonderful to work with Gale Literature Criticism. It's part of their 19th century literature and criticism database. And if any of you out there are educators, you know, if you're in the college level, if you're in the high school level, if you are a student out there, if you are just a lover of poetry or queer topics, definitely check out 19th Century Literature Criticism because I'm one of many entries out there um, for Gale Literature Criticism. But please share my article far and wide. Um, I'd be happy for you to do that. I really appreciate it. And it's also a teaser for you all of what's to come in my dissertation, which rumor has it, you might be hearing a little about my dissertation sometime in the future. And we are here going on a summer break. So I just want you all to know from June, June 12th is the last episode before our break. Mary and I are recording a really exciting summer break episode. Uh, school's out, so to speak, for the Ivory Tower Boiler Room and True Crime and, and Academia. We're taking a month to ourselves. I have um, the final process of my dissertation because my defense is July 7th. So, you know, I have to finalize a few things before my dissertation defense. And, you know, then at, people have started calling me Dr. Andrew Rimby, which technically I did get hooded. My doctor at hooding ceremony took place. But after my defense, everyone can call me Dr. Rimby and maybe I will change my social media to Dr. Rimby. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Um, but the episode I'm doing with Mary, it's going to be really fun, informal. We're going to talk about what TV and film we've been watching, what we're looking forward to in the summer. What are we doing with our summers? Any vacations we're going on? Recommendations we have for all of you out there, especially if you're in the Northeast. And yeah. Can't wait to just celebrate with Mary and then come back a month after um, June 12th. And during that month, make sure you catch up on all of these Ivory Tower Boiler Room episodes. It's Pride Month in June. We have a lot of LGBTQ topics on the podcast. 
you know, go back a year. Have you listened to all of our episodes? Like, have you listened from a year ago? Just make your way through the Ivory Tower Boiler Room catalog. There's probably so many conversations you haven't heard. Um, so with that being said, here is celebrating Andrews, my Walt Whitman and Queer Theory article with special guest Jack Parlett. LGBT stories are universal, but each one speaks to the individual heart and soul of the writer telling it. Do you have a story to tell? Have you been moved by an LGBT book, film, painting, television show, or other form of media? If so, the Gay and Lesbian Review wants to hear from you. The GNLR believes in bringing awareness to queer art and artists through reviews, commentary, and thought pieces in which the author relates their personal lives to a particular piece of art, a novel, a movie, or what have you. In addition to the articles published in the print magazine, the GNLR also publishes articles on its blog, as well as personal essays on its popular Here's My Story section. This allows people like you to share their own experiences with our readers. To learn more about submitting either to the print or the online edition of the GNLR, visit georeview.org. That's G L R E V I E W dot O R G. And scroll down to the bottom of the page to find a link to their writer's guidelines. If you have questions, email me at stephen.hemrick at georeview.org. The GNLR can't wait to see what you have to say. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. So, I was just chatting it up with my co-host here. I'll call him a co-host. This is kind of a Walt Whitman queer theory talk show. I was saying to Jack Parlett, who, friend of the show, he's been in the ivory tower before. So hi, Jack Parlett. Hey. Hey, Andrew. I just said you were in the ivory tower. I meant the ivory tower boiler room. <laughs> but maybe it's because I was like, he oh. was in the ivory tower. I'm in the ivory tower. I'm confused. <laughs> Don't know what's happening as I gear up for my uh, dissertation defense. Like, what's going to happen next? So, mm. you know, Jack was saying, you know, he's in a transition phase. I'm in a transition phase. My mom's in a transition phase. I feel like maybe it's the Aries power and... I know that we're in a big astrological moment right now from my friends. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I just it's keep going to that. It's the yeah. Aries. Yeah. Um, yeah. but it's all exciting. I feel everyone is finding their passions right now. Um, you know, I have Jack here. First, if you haven't, Jack wrote an incredible book that I reference multiple times in my dissertation, um, The Poetics of Cruising. Um, Fire Island doesn't come up in the dissertation, but uh, Jack wrote um, a Fire Island book, and he came on in the September. So listen back to September 2022. And then I did a whole episode about going away to Fire Island for my 30th birthday. And um, yeah, Jack was like, well, so what happened, Andrew? And, you know, I think I was there right after Labor Day, Jack. And um it was really nice to be there on the quote unquote off season because the weather was still like 75 so I could swim and lay out. But probably like what you've seen, there's such a difference between the tourist queer Fire Island scene and the local. So I was like in the local scene, which was mm -hmm. enjoyable. Um, but did you... You know, were you ever there in the off season of Fire Island? I haven't been there in the off season, or certainly not like that side of the off season, the kind of autumn, fall off season. Um, I feel like I've read a lot about it, and it sounds kind of like a particularly magical moment in the year, right? Like I'm, I'm thinking a lot of the Andrew Holleran and the light in September, the light changes. Um, so yeah, I haven't, I haven't been out after after Labor Day, but I can imagine that calm or relative calm compared to the main season is quite special. Yeah, I met a lot of um, writers, actually. And one of them I just had on the show, we did this whole Madeline Kahn deep dive, and he wrote the only Madeline Kahn biography, William V. Madison. He was at the Belvedere with um, his husband. 
And yeah, so I like met all these artists and I like at the Belvedere, there was a real, um, you know me, Jack. I like, I'm trying to find out everyone's story, even like I'm not I... prodding, but I'm just like, oh yeah, tell me yeah. what's going. Like, I felt that that was a really inviting atmosphere. I yeah. am going back to the Belvedere. Actually, when this comes out, it's funny. I only have Jack. I have Jack come every time I go to the Belvedere. Uh, but I'll be going at the end of June. The last, actually, it'll be the last week. And as this comes out, I probably have just sent out my final dissertation because that I booked my trip with the intention of this is when you send out your dissertation, Andrew. Mm -hmm. It's a good extrinsic that's goal. A, that's a great idea. Hit send straight to Fire Island. Like the, yeah, release. Exactly. Come back to my defense with a tan and glammed up <laughs> to the nines. No. But um, you're right. There was a magical essence. Like when I, I love running on the beach and I would like run on the beach from Cherry Grove to the Pines and um, just maybe I would pass two people. So it's like a really different in June, it's definitely going to be busier. I go for day trips in July and August. So like I know what the busy time is, quote unquote, but I still have never been there on a holiday, which I probably won't do because I'm lucky that I live right at a beach on the Long Island Sound. So I usually go to my quiet beach and then mm. Fire Island for the experience. Um, yeah. But yeah, so... Um, what I'm really excited about is the first thanks for celebrating my new article, Walt Whitman and Queer Theory. And congratulations on the article. Well, thank you, Jack. And I mean, you've been my uh, spirit mentor, uh, spirit Whitman queer <laughs> enigma <laughs> in my life. And, you know, I think you're, we're only separated by, I don't know, five years. I'm 30 now. Are you how old are you, Jack? I am also, I'm 31, just turned ah, 31. Okay, so we're actually really close um, yeah. in age. And I just find it interesting how across the pond in England, you were thinking, um, you know, you also were really drawn to Whitman's cruising idea, mm. but like you took it in, what I love is in your book, you take it into the photographic realm, like photography, how that's a, helpful yeah. symbol and metaphor to think about with, I mean, Whitman is brief, not brief, but Whitman is one of many in your book. Um, mm. Right. I mean, who else do you, there's other writers that you discuss besides Whitman. Yeah. I talk about Frank O'Hara and uh, David Wonorovich and Eileen Miles and Langston Hughes. Um, those are kind of the main, the main figures in the book. Um of course, like separated, you know, they're 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 writing in very different historical moments. Um, but there's something about I think the the photographic as an essence or as a way of thinking through queer desire that can kind of illuminate some of the ways that they're writing about it across time. Yeah. Well, and you know, I basically now have cemented myself as a Whitman queer scholar, which is true. Um, and, you know, I consider you part of the Whitman queer scholarly group. It's, you know, I always say that I am a LGBTQ literary scholar or just an LGBTQ cultural scholar to the broad public because, right, they understand that nomenclature and language more than pinpointing, you know, because I also could do, we can talk about so many subjects. And I mean, you went into Fire Island and the 20, even into the 20th to the 21st century. Mm -hmm. So like you've given me so much advice, Jack, about how you brought in your scope. And, you know, I've started to claim my um, power of being a quote unquote expert, especially when I've been applying for jobs. It's like, oh, well, I can teach you know, I've taught the Broadway musical. I have had podcast episodes and research about it. Like, oh, I'm a film scholar. And, you know, it's that whole, what are you, like, where are we right now in terms of what it means to have a PhD? And like, I've thought a lot about that, especially um, being so openly and unapologetically 
um, a queer male scholar and a media presence, which, you know, mm. I know there's a lot of eyes on what I do and I have welcomed it. It's not like this isn't a pity party uh, mm. because I've wanted to do this public work. But at the same time, when I've been applying, Jack, to different positions, and I'm sure you feel this way when you're, you know, a freelance um, scholar and an independent scholar, that um, you, we position ourselves. And I think, okay, well, I've been so unfiltered and uncensored in all of these topics about sex, about the media, like things that I teach and what I do in my work uh, maybe it won't uh, play well for such and such place, but it mm -hmm. will for an LGBTQ nonprofit that I've applied to, which has happened. Or I've applied to a prep school that has welcomed a podcast presence. I've applied to colleges, you know, so mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to. It feels like walking a tightrope, if you can. I'm sure you can relate to that. Okay, so does everyone know that when I'm not a podcaster, I'm actually writing academic scholarship, teaching in the university, and just doing all my queer male scholarly inquiries and analyses. So I am so excited to be talking about one of my favorite academic publishers, Broadview Press. They are an independent academic publisher they publish in the humanities. Um, they produce high quality, pedagogically useful books for university and college classrooms. But as you'll soon learn, they also publish for literary enthusiasts and literature lovers. So they're always publishing with an eye towards diversity. There's so many titles from female authors, from writers of color and for example, in the fall, we had on Ann Stevens on our podcast. So listen to that episode where she talked all about literary theory and criticism. And as you'll hear, she explains why literary theory is not, imp not important only to university scholars and to students of literature, but also to those arts and culture lovers out there, which all of you are a part of that community. So she discusses why watching Bridgerton actually requires a certain literary theory. And then we play a Wizard of Oz game where she analyzes the Wizard of Oz from all of these different schools of thought, including psychoanalysis, Marxism, feminist theory, queer theory. So what I love is that Broadview is offering 20% off with the code Ivory Tower. So head on over to their website and you will get 20% off with the code Ivory Tower. And if you haven't listened to our most recent episode with Jeffrey Weinstock, who wrote Pop Culture for Beginners, yes, the first ever university analysis of pop culture, which is really resonating with me since you all know I'm a huge Real Housewives fan, but also he wrote the Mad Scientist Guide to Composition. So I know so many of you out there teach composition or need more writing tips. Jeffrey Weinstock just came on the podcast. Listen to our interview with him. And again, 20% off all Broadview Press texts. Use the code Ivory Tower. Head over to their website. The link is in our episode notes. Enjoy your reading. Hi, this is Andrew. So as some of you might know, I've been such a fan of the Gay and Lesbian Review bi-monthly magazine of history, culture, and politics that publishes essays in a wide range of disciplines, as well as a slew of reviews of books, plays, and movies, and a number of special features, such as artist profiles and the popular art memo column, did you know we actually had two of the writers on the Ivory Tower Boiler Room podcast, Ignacio Darnad and Vernon Rosario? So if you haven't, make sure you listen to those episodes. Each GNLR issue brings you consistently intelligent, lively, thought-provoking articles focused on a unifying theme and brings together the leading minds on the topic. 
You won't find a lot about the latest dating fads or fashion trends, though you might find articles about online dating as a social phenomenon, like Grindr, which I have some experience with, or the gay influence on 20th century fashion. Now, for a special offer, when you subscribe to the GNLR, you'll receive a free copy with any print or digital subscription. That's seven instead of six. Visit glreview.org. That's G-L-R-E-V-I-E-W dot org. Click subscribe and enter promo code ITBR for your free issue. And as an added bonus, you'll receive online access to all archived issues of the magazine. Enjoy your reading. Yeah, absolutely. And I like when I published the Fire Island book last year, there I, you know, we, we talked about before and, and other conversations that I chose to write that book with a personal perspective and to sort of incorporate aspects of memoir in it. And it's funny, like before it had come out, I think I'd forgotten <laughs> uh like exactly how how exposing it was in some ways. And um then then after it came out having conversations with people on you know, they would point to certain moments about, you know, st- my relationship to to my body, to sex, to drinking. Um, and I and I suddenly th- there was a part of me that recoiled. I thought, wow, that's that I put that out there now. And um, uh, but I but I also think ultimately, yeah, there's something quite liberating about doing that as well. Um, but I, I yeah, I get what you're saying. Think when you're thinking about how to professionalize and the kinds of things you're going for, like being conscious of how you appear publicly um yeah it's something to be like you say a tightrope something to be negotiated yeah it's where when you were on andy cohen's radio show which was so fun like a few weeks after our episode came out i'm like wait because i listened to and Ra- radio andy and i'm like wait jack yeah. parlay or you had posted about it and i'm like wait i have to listen to this and yeah i'm just excited to know again talk about a um public forum and a media venue like Andy Cohen is in that fire well he's in the Hampton scene but he goes to Fire Island a lot and he's very into arts and culture so it makes sense that that book would have reg- um, resonated with him your Fire Island book but how did that come about Jack like did his representative reach out or like do you know how Andy Cohen got to know your work um, no, I don't know directly how that happened, but his team reached out to my publishers and it kind of came together, uh, that way. Um, so I, I don't know whether someone, someone in his team knew about the book or something, but yeah, it was, it was exciting. It was, I was glad to have that conversation with him. Yeah. You were trending basically. Well, but that's where <laughs> podcasts or anytime you do media appearances, right? Like now I'm starting to see a lot of, um, uh, or my TikTok feed for the Ivory Tower Boiler Room now has a lot of Madeline Kahn videos, but it makes sense. Like I've started to put out all these clips and like, then it feeds the algorithm and then you get people talking and there's a conversation. And I'm not saying like, just, I know it's not just my show, but like everyone starts to, it, it just becomes a domino effect in terms of, mm-hmm appearances and publicity and I don't know I've always been interested in like why I love what I do here and why I love what you're doing Jack being so open with your work is promoting your work branding how you brand yourself and your image but you right we can curate a sense of what we do but when it comes to how the public receives it it's out of your control. Like I've just had to let go of the, we can craft our own narrative, right? Anyone who reads our work, that's up to that reader. But maybe, Mm -hmm. right, it's different when it's a reader than when it's in the social media sphere. And I think Mm -hmm. um, that's what I've learned is in academia, there's been, the reach traditionally has only gone so far amongst academics, not to the broad public. And like when, say, an academic's work reaches the airwaves like yours did, Jack, or 
you know, how many I'm sure have given you feedback, uh, warranted or not, which, you know, we all get our critiques. Um, you know, how do you deal with how much press your work does get? Like, how have you mentally mm. uh, prepared yourself for just tuning out what feedback is just not helpful for your creative process? Because, like, I'm still trying to learn that. Yeah, I mean, I think such a wishy-washy answer, I know. But, like, I, I think something that I uh was thinking a lot about when the book came out was about boundaries and sort of setting boundaries with yourself and i i kind of know myself and i could i could totally imagine um in some ways going looking for the for negative responses to the book and i there of course they're there like you you know no one ever publishes anything that everybody likes and like the like social media provides a space for all of those opinions to be expressed. And so I think I just was quite, yeah, was quite firm with myself that I was like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do a deep dive into Amazon reviews. If I'm gonna look at, if I'm gonna look at Twitter, I'm gonna be quite boundaried with how I do that and maybe do it once every couple of days or something like that. Um, and then I've, and then, yeah, I've had, I've had exchanges with people over email or, or over social media that have been really lovely. And it's been about people responding to the book and that feels really really special um those sorts of direct communications but yeah for me I think I mean you I I feel like you are very skilled at social media right and you were saying about learning how to understand the algorithm and I think I don't feel very naturally at, at home in it so I think for me it was about yeah I guess just controlling my relationship to it and and um and 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 also trying to yeah, trying trying to remember that, like, you you've let go of the the thing is out there now, and like you you have to let go of it in some way and uh, accept that people will respond to it differently. Yeah, well, and I think the power for me of social media, I mean, the trolls are minuscule. I mean, <laughs> they're there, but like, I don't, I actually, if it's causing a conversation, that's a positive. Now, if it was like threatening me that's totally different um but we're not gonna go there and thank goodness yeah. you know knock on wood um have not faced that but um oh yeah no sorry i don't at all mean to imply I, like i think social media provides like such a, a great and amazing space to oh, find yeah, no. viewers and um i'm not very good at it i think <laughs> i don't really oh, yeah. know how well, to use it you know maybe like you know if um it's in need. I should uh, start a. I have thought about uh, like doing consultant, being a consultant for social media for um, arts and culture figures, especially writers, because I feel like writers um, and academics, of course, um, not of course, but I feel like as academics, you're taught in a way like I've had a deep program myself about not speaking of your work and promoting your work and um like that's why i've had to own oh yeah i wrote this whitman and queer theory article and i'm so proud of it and i'm excited about my dissertation and like i've sent my um defense invitation because it's a public defense here um in america well most american ones are i'm not sure about the uk um but like, do they let anyone come to yes. your defense? No, in no, in the UK system, I mean, as far as I know, um, it's it's like a it's a closed thing. It's it will be you with two, usually two examiners, um, oh, and so it's not so it's not a public thing at all. And it's also not really a presentation in the same way. Like my, I mean, I don't know the ins and outs of it. But my sense is in the US system, it's very much like you are presenting your work, and then you'll have a discussion about it and. Uh, yeah, it's to yeah, totally different in the UK. Yeah, no, I'm going to have a like 40 to 50 minute presentation slash lecture. Like it reminds me of my mm -hmm. lecture formats. Um, and I actually have a committee of five. Wait, yes. Right. Um, I mean, I could call them out, which is good. I have my advisor, um, Susan Sheckel, who does 19th century American literature. Then I have Michael Tandre, who's a Victorian scholar at Stony Brook. 
Then I have Victoria Hesford, who's a queer feminist scholar. Then I have outside readers who are two. Karen Carpenter is a Whitman scholar. And then I have Nikos Panu, who's a Greek scholar, but specifically for my dissertation, has helped me with all the ancient Greek references. So it's like it fits my project because it is yeah. trans. It is Whitman and his reception. It's basically two parts. Whitman's homoerotic poetics and what does that mean? Like, where was he drawing his influence from? And then where does his influence take us after death into the Victorian readers, which sets up for a second book? Like the first would be Whitman's homoerotic poetics. The second would be Whitman's queer Victorian readers. Because like, as mm -hmm. you know, once you mention John Addington Simmons and Oscar Wilde, there's a whole other slew yeah. of responses. Yeah. 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 Like that briefly touches the surface. Like I'm not even getting into the Rossettis and Swinburne. Yeah. And I mean, it's <laughs> long lasting. And I mean, E.M. E. Forster, definitely the... Bloomsbury group is part of that mm -hmm. conversation. So yeah, things to look forward to. Um, but, you know, what I was so excited about is when I've referenced your work in the article, I can speak to, but there was a quote of yours that I just love that appears at the end of my article. And it's um, in the Poetics of Cruising, Jack Parlett argues that using the theoretical term queer, and hopefully you don't mind me, I always know, like when you reference someone in your someone's work in their presence, I mean, it's a pat on your back, Jack, hopefully uh, you feel that way and not embarrassed. Um, no, no. But that you argue that using the theoretical term queer, um, it allowed you to reject, quote, binary or deterministic labels and move past the methodological etiquette of appropriateness versus anachronism. And I mean, that's what's helped me so much with your, you know, reading your work is that it's not one or the other. Like you have taught me what it means to delve into the liminality of queerness, you know, not binary or not um, fully fluid. Like we need to somehow see the messiness of the writer's work. And, mm -hmm. you know, I want to thank you for that because I was struggling with how to articulate Whitman's liminal, what I argue as liminal queerness, because he's mm -hmm. neither a speaker. And again, I'll use speaker in his poetry. I'm very like adamant. <laughs> it's the speaker. Maybe it's autobiographical. We don't know. Um, but that his speaker in Song of Myself, in my argument, is that it's hesitant, like the homoeroticism is there, but it's not out of the closet, like in that mm -hmm. kind of concept of claiming that Whitman, the man is somehow coming out. But like in mm -hmm. Calamus, there's definitely a shift. So like for me, your work in the Poetics of Cruising, you've really helped me understand Calamus and that cruising idea because, um, you're right. There's such a presence of like, how do we articulate this idea of male same sex desire without being anachronistic, but also being able to be creative and indulge in using terms that, of course, Whitman is not aware of, right? Like, yeah. you can never yeah. fully get out of anachronism. Yeah. Yeah. Well, right. And that's in a way, that's what the word queer does, right? Like to use it in a kind of deliberate way is is also to sort of like name anachronism and also not not care about that in some way or to sort of like to stake a claim to like something as opposed to, I guess, trying to not that the term gay is always a box for something to be fit in. I mean, like one of the things I find interesting about this is that there are obviously so many scenes and images and motifs in Whitman that feel like gay, right? Like as in this kind of homosocial vision. But I feel like what the word queer does is allow us to 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 sort of dig into some of those, like some like some of the more radical and kind of indeterminate, or as you say, like actually less explicit, more sort of incipient moments where it feels like desire is 
desire is figured but not necessarily named um and that that it's actually yeah something far more liminal than a kind of coherent gay politic hi this is andrew so you know when i'm not here in the ivory tower boiler room sometimes i'm actually invited to be on other podcasts as a guest well there is one podcast run by christian garcia and um, his co-host, Nate, that I absolutely love. It is called That Old Gay Classic Cinema. So calling all you classic cinema fans out there and those who love queer theme cinema, which I think there's a lot of you who are listening right now where you've uh, perked up. So follow them on Instagram at That Old o -L, Gay Classic Cinema. The first ever episode I was featured as a guest, it's The Sound of Music. I got to talk about being Captain Von Trapp in high school, and it's just such an exciting conversation. They've also featured discussions about Gone with the Wind, The Wizard of Oz, which features guests from uh, the podcast The Garland Gab and Down the Yellow Brick Pod. There is a deep dive of Cinderella, and recently they had an episode on the film Giant starring Elizabeth Taylor, Rock Hudson, and James Dean. And actually, one of the uh, guests, Lauren Randall, I know from Stony Brook University's PhD English department. So shout out, Lauren. Um, you can listen to That Old Gay Classic Cinema on Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. It's definitely such a great listen. So why not listen to it after you listen to this current episode on the Ivory Tower Boiler Room? Hey, Ivory Tower Boiler Room listeners and true crime friends. You've heard me gush over this incredible woman and her beautiful products. I'm talking about Mandy Made It. Mandy makes customized and original crochet and cre-cut goods. They are the perfect, unique, one-of-a-kind gift for literally anyone in your life. And she makes incredible home decor. I still have my pumpkins that I put out every fall. I just love them. Check her out on Instagram at M-A-N-D-E-E -E, Made It or search Mandy Made It on Facebook. To order, just slide into her DMs. And if you mention the Ivory Tower Boiler Room, you will receive a free personalized gift with your first order. So... Go on Instagram and look up at Mandy Made It, and Mandy is spelled M-A-N-D-E-E. -E. Again, her handle is at Mandy Made It, Mandy spelled M-A-N-D-E-E, -E, and order today. Yeah, well, and... Talk about staking a claim. I was so happy about this last sentence. You know when you, of course you do, but when you write and we struggle so as writers, I mean, the hardest part for me is just getting um, getting that first sentence out when I return back to the document. And like now I'm actually starting to do a groundedness five minute meditation before because maybe I think it is helping relieve the writer's block idea. But like I found ways, I'm sure you have methods, Jack, but I like to always put a note like wherever I left off. I'll like write, this needs a transition sentence or like this is where I'm going next. And I have margin, marginalia, um, Google Doc notes for myself. Um, but, you know, to talk about staking a claim, this last sentence, I'm just I was so excited. <laughs> to write it, but the work of Rimby Parlett and other recent scholars offers promise for future studies by posing the question, what happens if Whitman's queer male poetics is allowed to speak for itself and his male homoerotic poetic language stands on its own without being categorized as, quote, gay, quote, homosexual, or, quote, bisexual? And there you go. That is... You know, I mean, I couldn't have gotten there without your work. And, um, you know, I also get to soon. I mean, I think the episode will come out before this, but Tim Dean, I really look to 
basically the no nonsense queer male scholars in my life um and feminist scholars of course too um like i love um heather love who's a queer and feminist scholar but um you know i like valerie roy a lot um i had david grevin on here and i really admire him um you know, so that's something with the podcast, Jack, that I actually get to talk to you all is mm. I always say to my advisor, this is my annotated bibliography. Like this is anyone I have on has been part of my creative process and peeling back those layers of what it means to create art mm. is, you know, something I think we're now entering into in this digital age is how do you create your art? Um, and yeah, I post risque photos sometimes and I realize okay well I I've been as transparent as possible about who I am and where I stand so you know I know an employer who values what I do they can't say they're surprised about what I'm bringing to the table mm -hmm. yeah so you know I'm trying I'm finding the like we're finding our community is how I see it is and was like that, a was that life. Yeah. Like as a question for you, I guess, like, was that something that you like were explicitly wanted to do when you thought about setting up the podcast that you wanted? I mean, a space, as you say, for those creative conversations, but also a space for you to be yourself. Right. Is that. Yeah. Is I that... think during the pandemic, I was. Or like during my academic journey, like this will be nine years. Um, and. Like. <laughs> Andrew's gone through just like anyone through a PhD program, but um, like I have went straight from undergrad um, and I was like the giddy, very like I remember that Andrew in 2014 was just so eager, like boots to the ground. I still am like that, but I think I was really trying to show my worth in every seminar. Like I would just felt like, okay, I have to claim the space. I have to show my knowledge. I have to like contribute. And then I started to like realize, okay, this is a journey. And I really was struggling with feeling that I needed to have validation from my university and then realized, wait, like during the pandemic, I really realized this, but it came a little before that. I realized, okay, if I only rely on getting acknowledgement from my own department or the university, that's not how my happiness, like I can't, I can't um, connect my happiness to receiving that type of validation. Like my happiness needs to come from the connections that I'm making both in and outside the university system. And mm -hmm. yeah, so the podcast was a result of that. Of It was mostly what do we do now that we're shut down during the pandemic? How do we have these conversations? That was like step one. And that's how the podcast first began. But then I realized that I was taking risks of just emailing artists that I admire and they would respond back. And I saw that I could really bring these types of conversations to the public and to others who I know are going through the journey that I went through and they're trying to figure out, you know, if they want to have a broader reach, that it's possible. And yeah, I just started to take risks of this is who I am. I'm, mm. you know, a gay male. I'm not it's part of my work. Like it's very present. And I am so open about homoeroticism and um, I want to have these unfiltered conversations. So yeah, no, thanks for asking that check. <laughs> sure. Yeah, it was, but at the same time, I always give advice because I do what's nice is so many will reach out and say, should I create a podcast? Or they'll ask me for a type of consultant idea and i always say like if you're going to create a media larger media footprint 
just think it through. Like I have always had a business plan. Like I've always, mm. even with you, Jack, I knew when your episode would fit in. Like I knew it would be probably in the summer. I knew that it would be as I was working on your writing in my dissertation. Like it's always been mm. things fitting in clusters mm. and even my social media, I think, okay, am I posting this for what reason? Like, what brand am I representing? Who am I connecting to? For me, it's all been about networking or am I engaging more of the LGBTQ community because of this photo? Like, I always just, if you're going to have a public social media presence, why are you doing what you're doing, right? If you have a private social media, that's completely different. Um, but I don't, everyone can find me. Like everyone, even at the university, they said, I'm going to miss you, Andrew. And I said, I'm everywhere on social media. You'll so if you want to yeah. like reach out to me, you'll find me. Um, but yeah, no, thank you, Jack. And is there anything, you know, like, where are you in your writing? I mean, you don't have to be, you could be taking a break from writing, which I understand, but like, is there anything you're currently grasping and attracted to? Yeah, I'm I'm working on a new book proposal at the moment about um about what it means to be flamboyant. Um is oh, nice. is is a question that I've sat with for a long time and uh yeah, I'm working on another non-fiction book that I guess is sort of tries to address that question like to think about what flamboyance is as a concept, as a behavior, as an aesthetic, um, the ways that it's that it's different from camp, um, and retracing some of its roots to the original French meaning where it, it relates to flames and fire. Yes, and, yes, I remember because we talked about yeah. that like derogatory flamer term and exactly like, yeah. why where is the root of that? It's gonna be well, I can't uh, wait. Yeah. Yeah, and there's something kind of old fashioned about it as a term now. I think you don't hear it, you know, you don't hear it as often, and it's often as a term, like has been used in a kind of euphemistic way, right? Like that you might describe someone as flamboyant if you're implying that they're that they're gay or queer, um, or that you're just implying that they're kind of too much. Um, so I guess I'm sort of interested in like some of the social uses of that word and. Um, what it tells us about how flamboyance is valued culturally, because I think in in many ways it's it's actually at the heart of popular culture. It's at the heart of what show business is, certainly. Um, so, yeah, the next book is, is a deep dive into some of those questions. Um, the writing is happening. It's it's happening. That's that. <laughs> that's all oh, I can good. say. I'm working on the proposal at the moment still. OK, well, I'm excited, Jack. And. You know, we'll be in touch. I know we're going to continue being in touch. Um, yeah. yeah. And well, hopefully, I mean, I'm sure you're doing this, but like what's coming to my mind is the Flanor concept. Um, and I always think of, of course, Oscar Wilde's yeah. photo, um, like dressed in that um, garb and his performance mm. quality. But, um, you know, and now you're, triggering in my mind that you know fag and that's such a strong derogatory term that we now know of all originated as a meaning of bundle of sticks and right it was almost connected to matches which right. again has a flame yeah. quality yeah 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 exactly well and i do just think like linguistically there's this there's this interesting unease with fire Right. As something that's both like dangerous and a spectacle and something that you're to steer clear of. Like, I think so much there's a lot contained within this linguistic angst about flaming that that kind of speaks about other kinds of fears as well. So mm -hmm. it, it feels like it's not. Yeah, it's not an accident that like some of those derogatory terms relate back to that. Well, it's the seductiveness of Dante's Inferno that it has all of the vices, but lust yeah. is present. Eroticism is there, of course, and it can consume yeah. you and quent and overwhelm the person who yeah. is the naive um, yeah. figure going down and making the journey, yeah, say, yeah, in the yeah. depths of hell. But OK, well, I can't wait. 
Jack. I'm so excited um, Thanks, with man. your work. And thank you for doing this. I'm just, you know, finally, there's a Queer Whitman podcast episode. So, <laughs> you know, I have to do my own publicity, too. I can't give away everything until the dissertation is out there. Um, yeah. Well, all the best slowly, with the dissertation yeah. and the defense. Thank you, Jack. And, you know, for everyone out there, I'm, we're going on a summer break. So listen to Jack's episode if you didn't listen to that before. Um, and there's a lot of steamy conversations in this podcast. So over the summer break, I'm going to give everyone homework. Listen to the steamy episodes and make their way through them. Um, OK, well, thank you, Jack. And I can't wait to talk to you again. Oh, yeah. how can everyone find you? Speaking of social media. How can people find me? Um, on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. I don't even know my <laughs> Instagram handle. I think um, <laughs> I wasn't lying when I said I'm not good at social media. I think it's uh, JVJ Parlet is my handle on Twitter and Instagram. Yeah. Okay. And we'll have it in the show notes. So we'll just Great. see what's in the show notes, everyone. Okay. Thank you, Jack. Have a good rest Thanks. of your day. Thanks, okay. Bye bye. <laughs> bye. Thank you so much for listening to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. This is Andrew Rimby, the executive director. I want you all to follow us on social media because there's so many video clips that we share and so many photos about these episodes. Follow us on TikTok and Instagram at Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Follow us on Twitter at Ivory Boiler Room. Follow our Facebook page, the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Join our Patreon, patreon.com slash Ivory Tower Boiler Room. For $5 a month, you get ad-free episodes, our video interviews, the True Crime and Academia bonus episodes, and all Ivory Tower Boiler Room bonus episodes. Thanks for buying a coffee for me. And thanks to an amazing team. Thanks, Mary. She's our chief contributor. And thanks to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room spring interns. Andrea, Caitlin, Sarah, Sheila, and Rosie. See you all again in the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. <laughs>